Mark, thank you so much for joining me for another episode of Starting Over with Shannon. I'm very excited to have this conversation. And speaking about psychedelics in particular, it's an entirely new subject for me that I've become increasingly interested in, like many people, in fact, because there's a lot of growth in that particular domain. And this is one of your specialties and something you've dabbled in yourself. So I'm eager to hear uh, your own experience, both personally and professionally. But where I want to start, Mark, is really ways in which you have had a starting over in your own life. Yeah, well, let me first just start by saying I'm so appreciative of you inviting me on this podcast. I love the vision for it. I'm so happy to be here. And yeah, in terms of significant starting over experiences, the first one that comes to mind is when I was eight years old. And I was a pretty, generally speaking, happy-go-lucky kind of athletic quote unquote, normal, um, normative, I suppose, in some demographic ways as well, child, you know, and, and with a lot of privilege as well. I feel like I should also acknowledge that in terms of the identities that I hold. Um, and when I was eight, I did go through this pretty traumatic episode. It was a, a febrile seizure that I suffered that really was a reset for me in a, a physiological, a spiritual and neurocognitive kind of way. And to summarize, what happened was I had a, uh, I was stricken with a strep throat and the doctors gave me penicillin and they didn't know that I was allergic to penicillin at the time. So I had this really strong allergic reaction. And the way my mom tells the story is she was at home alone that night watching a movie. And then she heard this really loud thumping sound coming from well, she didn't know where at the time she thought it was the washing machine on or something. So it was just loud, just like thump, thump, thump. And she comes to my room and she realizes that's where it's coming from. And so it turns out my temperature had gone up to 107 and I had gone into what's called a febrile seizure. And I was blue. I was without oxygen for so long that I was visibly blue. And wow. I would have died except for the fact that my saving grace was that the seizure was so violent that I was slamming my head against the wall repeatedly. Um, so much so that it actually bloodied the wall and then my head, it was pretty severe in terms of head wow. trauma. And that's what alerted her to the fact that something was wrong. And so she was able to call 911 and the paramedics came and I don't know all the details because I was obviously unconscious, but my assumption is they probably gave me some epinephrine and, you know, were able to revive me. And the reason it was so significant, I don't think anybody, including me in the aftermath of that, realized how traumatic it was because back then I don't think there was as much awareness as there is now about the traumatic brain injuries, like even mild traumatic brain injuries and how that can affect you. And also just the kind of medical trauma that can happen to children and how much that affects you. Because even though I was able to come back into consciousness and I seemed like, okay. And, you know, I went back home the next day and it seemed like everything was fine. It really wasn't fine. You know, and okay. when I kind of look back on my life, there was a shift that happened after that. I mean, it was a, it was a brush with death that was very significant for me in a psychological sense. And after that, I, became much more kind of depressive and much more existential. And I would say much more spiritual. It was probably my first significant kind of spiritual experience of really coming to the edge of death and then coming back. And the other thing that made it so significant in terms of my history is that it, as far as I can tell, it left me with these kind of lasting neurocognitive challenges. And it's kind of hard to describe, but the best way I can summarize it is that it, it's felt for most of my life as if I'm almost this kind of broken robot who's trying to emulate being human. And there could be some kind of autism spectrum stuff there as well. But it, it, a lot of it feels just very kind of neurocognitive. Right? I just have an incredibly, I've had, you know, for most of my life, this incredibly hard time just really being present, like in the flow of conversations, like always just feeling a little bit a step behind or a little bit at a remove and feeling like there's just so much effort in having to just function. And that's been incredibly challenging. And as yeah. hard as that's been, the silver lining of it or the sort of resiliency aspect of it is that it did at a very young age inspire me to, to seek in a spiritual sense, you know, how can I alleviate the suffering that feels like it's so in my mind? It became very clear to me at a young age that no matter what my circumstances were, no matter, you know, who I was with or whether I was, you know, just as a kid, like going to see a fun movie or something like that, I was always at some low level 
or even higher level, just really miserable. Like life just always felt like this kind of fever dream or something like that. And so it really just forced me to to investigate internally of my own mind. And, and that's how I started getting interested in meditation. From that really, age as well? It was not at that age. It was a bit later, I would say. Like, I definitely developed an interest in Buddhism at a pretty young age. But it wasn't until college when I, all this, this kind of, depression and and neuroinflammation and neurocognitive issues just really came to a head where I just couldn't function in college. And so I dropped out of college and that's when I discovered meditation. And when I first sat down on the cushion, I'll never forget the first time I meditated. I just had this really strong sense of, oh my God, this is what I need. This is a path of healing for me. I'm really learning how to relate to my own thoughts, my own mind in a different way. And this is what's going to be really transformative for me in terms of my healing. And so often our suffering does, right? It, it gives us so many challenges and it also forces us to cultivate resilience and to seek wisdom too. Yeah, you know? absolutely. And I imagine the decision you were at Harvard, weren't you? I was. I remember yeah. reading that you said you felt quite empty receiving the acceptance letter. I mean, that's something that we all we all think if that happened to us, we would be overcome with joy. But I think you had said you'd really had launched yourself into academic achievement as a means to seek love that was perhaps absent in some way for you. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate you asking about that. That's definitely true. And that's certainly another piece I haven't touched on yet. I mean, there was there was certainly a sense of shame and inadequacy that I was dealing with because of these neurocognitive challenges. And so there was, I think, a sort of overcompensation of, well, if I, if I work really, really, really hard and achieve, that can help me feel better about myself. And I was certainly, I believe, trying to heal certain deficits coming from my childhood in terms of, there was a lot of trauma growing up in my childhood in terms of corporal punishments and a lot of religious trauma. And my father at a pretty young age was very unfaithful in a pretty serial way. And that ended up having a big split in my parents' relationship that was pretty, pretty upsetting. And so so yeah, I do feel like there was an internalized sense of unworthiness on multiple levels that was playing out, you know, emotionally and also kind of cognitively and the way that I always felt kind of out of it or like a sort of space cadet. There was just so many situations where people would give me this kind of feedback of like, well, what's wrong with you and, you know, snap out of it or you know, what's going on. So I just, I, I definitely had this sense of being broken as the best kind of, yeah. I said before that kind of story. And so, so yeah, I do think there was something at a superficial level to assuage that of being able to say, oh, well, look at me, I have this kind of accolade and I can work really hard and achieve academically. But beneath that, of course, there was definitely a sense of emptiness and unworthiness that still wasn't addressed. And it didn't begin to really be addressed until I began to meditate. And that's when things started to change. Yeah, we'll develop that a little bit more. I'm curious about the meditation because, you know, a constant theme on this podcast in life in general, really, when we are chasing something externally to fill an internal deficit in some way. And I hear time and again about people when they finally stop and slow down and get acquainted with what's going on on the inside. That's when the external shifts too, not only the yes. internal yeah, absolutely. I'm wondering what else is there another shift that led you into? Sure. Yeah. Well, one important realization and reset or starting over experience for me has been taking a look at my own gender identity and, and sexual orientation. And it this happened as a kind of accident or sort of injury in a way, because I was experimenting in my own healing work with mushrooms. And I began to add in a lion's mane mushroom along with the psilocybin mushrooms. This is a po kind of popular combination. It's colloquially known as the, the Stamets stack from Paul Stamets, who is an advocate of combining lion's mane, psilocybin mushrooms, and, and niacin as well. I wasn't doing the niacin, but what I did not know, it took me a long time to figure this out, is that it actually turns out that I have a pretty significant inflammatory allergic response to mushrooms, um, which is kind of shocking because this is the work that I do professionally. It just took me a very long time to figure that out because I, I'd taken them for years, starting back in 2018. And 
it was always very difficult physiologically for me, but I never really paid much heat because I thought, oh, that's just part of the process. It's part of the body load. However, there was something about this one day when I was taking the combination of the lion's mane, which is a very powerful mushroom as well with the psilocybin, that it just really kicked off this both acute and it turns out, you know, chronic neuroinflammatory condition that I'm actually still dealing with to this day. It's been about two years since the initial experience. It's mostly gone, but it's still there. But the reason I mention it is because it, it took me on this really interesting journey because when your brain is chronically inflamed in this really intense way, it just, it's almost like having a kind of traumatic brain injury. That's just like always happening where you just, I experienced all these intense cognitive deficits for a really long time. So I was just having trouble with short-term memory, with just, you know, even orienting my body. I mean, I would reach for doorknobs and just miss them, drop things, you know, forget words, forget definitions of just very simple things, just have a really hard time functioning in many different aspects of my life conceptually. So this was a really challenging spiritual struggle that also prompted me to go even deeper into my meditation where I found more relief from this. But another interesting aspect of this that emerged is a shift in my own relationship with my identity. And the best way I can describe this is that it, it, it felt to me as if identity is kind of this aspect of ourselves that we present when there's sort of like a query to it. So it's like if you're filling out a form, right? It's like, okay, what's my gender identity? What's my sexual, you know, what's my racial identity? Or if someone's asking you in conversation, we call to mind. So it's almost like we're reaching into some kind of cabinet and just like presenting, ah, here's this and here's that. Just we're sort of easily at hand. So it's automatic or reflexive. And part of what happened to me in this intense neuroinflammatory period is that automaticity was completely scrambled. So I found myself in all sorts of situations where I would be calling upon my gender identity or sexual identity for a forum or for a conversation. And I would just sort of reach in my mind for that. And it just wouldn't be there. There would be nothing there. And it was very disturbing, actually, at first, because I felt just the sense of, well, who, who am I? The, the cabinet of identity categories has been emptied in a sense, or it's been sort of scrambled. And it was very unnerving. However, as I worked through that, and this is a big part of, of course, you know, the Buddhist philosophical tradition is the sense of no self and the sense of the self is fluid, right? And so I was experiencing this. So I was forced to experience this at a more visceral level. And then that's kind of prompted me to realize, well, I'll, to, to really start over. I mean, in line with the theme of your show, it's like, well, if the cabinet is empty, well, like, who am I? Really, at the age of 37, like, am I really straight? Am I really, uh, you know, cisgender? And I started to realize that those identifying labels just didn't hold any particular weight for me anymore. Um, so yeah. just just for clarity's sake, when you're describing this ca this cabinet, you yeah. knew you knew the categories that have been socially defined. You had the yes. terminology for it. You just somehow hadn't made the attachment to being you and a form of your own identity. A bit of both. Like at certain points in time, my mind was literally so scrambled that even sometimes just simple words wouldn't make sense anymore. I mean, it was really that bad. I mean, I, okay. I was, you know, I was at the point where I was just watching TV with my six-year-old and like having a hard time following just really simple children's programming. Like my mind was really that impaired. So it, there was a level to which even the identity categories themselves were feeling very fuzzy and amorphous. Um, and yes, my kind of automatic identification with them as such was also impaired. So it was kind of both. So there was this really deep starting over, not only of just who am I, but also what even is gender? <laughs> like what even is a man? What even is a woman, what even is, you know, what does it even mean to be straight? I mean, sometimes there would just be this kind of blankness, um, almost like that kind of what they call semantic satiation, where when you keep repeating a word, it just loses its meaning. I was experiencing that kind of sa satiation, a little bit of a tongue twister, like almost all the time at a certain point, just like complete fuzz and fog in my mind. And so I really had to kind of rebuild my, not only my personal identity, but my relationship with social identities and constructed identities all over again. You know, I spent hours literally just like looking up words in the dictionary because I would just be talking and I would realize I have no idea what this word means or I have no idea uh, how to say this correctly. So I spent just countless hours just Googling very simple phrases because I just couldn't speak properly or I would doubt myself. So it was very disturbing, almost like an aphasia. But yeah, I realized, I came to realize that my 
gender and and sexual orientation as a child was actually qu this quite expansive field of possibilities. And that growing up in a family, you know, growing up in Texas and this kind of fundamentalist Christian family that was traumatized into this very, very narrow channel. You know, talk about the ski slopes, right? It's like, where it's like, basically it had to be straight and it had to be cisgender because if I were to deviate from that even slightly, the result would be violence, actually. You know, wow. you know wow. physical violence, bullying, emotional violence, right? And so that was, and so there was so much shame there. But through this experience in combination, even though it was absolutely horrendous to go through, the experience of this mental fragmentation, plus the psilocybin, which was also just unearthing all this deep shame, I suddenly just didn't feel any shame anymore. It was just gone. And I realized, oh my God, I'm I'm queer. And I'm not even, not only am I queer, but I, I'm non-binary. Like I, I can use different pronouns and that actually feels really resonant with who I am. And I started to experiment with my clothing and now I, you know, I regularly wear skirts out in public and that just feels more resonant with who I am. And so I've experienced just this deep liberation from the oppressive constrictions of the, the gender binary and this sort of cis heteronormativity as it's called. And it's been just really, really, really deeply healing for me. And so I just really wanted to share that yeah. with our listeners. And um, how do you feel? Do you feel more free, more whole, more loved, absolutely. more lovable? Yeah. I feel so free. And and I, I want to say, you know, again, thanks for the show notes. Like I was really inspired by this gender queer performance artist and poet and author named Alok. It's spelled A-L-O-K. And they just really they're just talking about the, the, the freedom that we experience. And I don't want to say that, you know, sort of try to pathologize people who do self-identify as straight or cisgender, by all means, that's your identification. But I think many of us live in this kind of almost um, this kind of constriction because we feel like there's no other way to be because of shame and violence that keep us there. And so Alok was talking about, I was listening to this podcast about trying to de-gender fashion and really trying to boldly live outside the gender binary. And it just, it just absolutely struck this chord in me. I just, I listened to that and I just thought, my God, this is, this is who I am. This is so resonant with, with like every fiber of my being. This feels so connected and alive. And that was a big turning point for me. And I do feel, yes, I feel, I just, I realized like even at a somatic level, I was carrying this kind of shame that was like this heaviness just stuck in my, in my gut, actually you know, this kind of feeling of yuckiness. And and during one of these psilocybin sessions, well, it was the that particular one with the, the combination of the lion's mane and psilocybin where everything just exploded. I felt this deep sense of shame in my stomach just release. It was very almost volcanic. It just like exploded. But after that, the shame was just gone. It was like, I can be whoever I want to be. And there's no, I don't feel afraid. I feel free. I feel like playful. Um, and it's a wonderful feeling. And I wish that I wish that everybody could feel the freedom in our society to play with their gender expression, their clothing as they see fit, you know, that's resonate with themselves without the fear of violence and of, of trauma. Yeah. Mm. And of negative judgment. I think that's what also just keeps people. It's the ostracization. It's the fear of not belonging, not being part of a group. And Exactly. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you for sharing that. That's sure. that's really beautiful. So. Is there anything else that stands out to you in terms of this kind of awakening, spiritual yeah. awakening? The psychedelic piece is, you know, perhaps the last chapter of this, this story that I'm telling. And that began in 2018. So it's been about four years. So actually fairly recently. And I was always a bit skeptical of any kind of psychoactive drugs. I think that comes from my my very fundamentalist Christian upbringing, just this kind of negativity bias towards substances. However, I just living here in Oregon where there's so many mushrooms and there's such a culture of positivity around True. <laughs> mushroom usage, I just feel really curious. And I had a good friend and colleague in the social work field who was a fellow therapist. And one weekend we rented this, this cabin, this yurt actually on the Oregon coast. And I did mushrooms for the first time and it just honestly completely blew my world wide open. It was, it was just absolutely astonishing and bedazzling and both at a psychological level and a spiritual level, because at a spiritual level, yes, I've been doing all these meditations of looking inside, right. And trying to quiet my mind. 
And also the tradition I was working in Zen is a, is a non-dual tradition. So there's a sense that there is no separation between inside and outside, which I'd never really gotten. It was just sort of an intellectual idea. But all of a sudden on the mushrooms, it just becomes so startlingly obvious of like, oh, of course, there's no inside or outside because everything is consciousness. Like everything subjectively, at least, I don't make any claims. Okay, no, Mark, you're gonna truth. have to you're gonna have to break it down. Let's is the break mind. it down. Here. Okay, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, 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 no. But I was I was so gonna come to this because so many of us, I'm sure, people listening, if you followed mm. podcasts or literature or whatever in this sort of spiritual world, you will come across the term duality or non-duality, non-dualism. Yes, okay. Can, can break you down. break down what the heck that actually means? <laughs> yes, I can, and I should preface this by saying that there isn't one definition of this. So it, it has become a bit of a buzzword. And so people use the terms duality and non-duality in a lot of different ways. And it can get very confusing because sometimes I don't even know where people are coming from. And I have to really clarify, like, what, what do you mean by that term? So, so when I speak to this, I'm not claiming that I'm offering the definition. This is just sort of like the way that I understand it. Um, and then people can, can take that and play with it and test out their own truth. So, so you know, non duality and non-duality, the easiest way to talk about it is you could say at a spiritual level, this is perhaps the, the fundamental insight that is expressed and manifested in a lot of the world's major spiritual traditions. So if you look at Hinduism, especially the Advaita Vedanta tradition, if you look at Buddhism, Kashmir Shaivism, the Christian mystical tradition, Sufism, there is in all of these some kind of language around recognizing that you are what you seek. And so uh, the, the fact that you, you know, colloquially, you could say you, you are one with everything. That's sort of the old kind of cliche about it. Um, that the subjective feeling of being a separate self, a separate entity uh, stuck in the head that is is fundamentally separated from everything else in the field of awareness is an illusion. And that when we see through that illusion, we see that everything is in fact part of the same fabric of consciousness. That's talking about it in a spiritual sense. When I work with clients, I tend to default mostly to describing non-duality in a more neuroscientific approach because I find that's often more ecumenical and more accessible, especially for Western people. And in that Give sense- Give me that one then. <laughs> yeah. You could simply describe it as, I mean, in some ways it's kind of common sense, but we just don't really think about it much like that. Um, you know, if I take something like this pencil, I mean, pen, our intuitive knee jerk experience of this is, well, like I'm over here in my head. And of course, I know people are listening, so they may not be able to see what I'm saying. So I'll try to describe it, but I'm holding a pen right now in my hand up and, and, um, you know, intuitively we think, well, I'm over here I'm made of flesh and blood and I'm centered in my head. And I'm looking at this pen. This pen is a completely separate object from me, and it's made of plastic. However, if we think about this neuroscientifically, subjective from this actual subjective experience of consciousness, that's not actually what's going on. Because what I'm actually looking at here is not the actual 3D physical atomic object of the pen. What I'm looking at is a representation of the pen that my mind is generating right now. Um, and nobody knows exactly how this works. That's like the hard problem of consciousness. But from what we understand, you know, let's imagine that there is a physical 3D material world, which we don't know actually exists because no one can actually directly experience it. We only direct, we only experience consciousness. But uh, the theory would be that there's, you know, there's light, photons, you know, coming off this pen, going into my eyes, um, going to my optic nerve, and then being processed by my brain's visual center. And, and then there's some process that nobody understands scientifically, all of a sudden magic, there is, aha, there is this visual experience of a pen that is arising in consciousness. And so what that means is that this pen, it's not the actual thing. It's a representation of the thing. It's a kind of dream image in consciousness. So you could say it's like a, like pixels of consciousness arising in an appearance of a pen. And that's true for the pen. And it's also true for my hand. It's also true for my, my nose and my head and the computer screen and all the sounds arising. And so what that means is that even though everything seems to be separate if you look closely enough there is an actual subjective lived experience of it being all part of the same tapestry like like everything is just sort of like waves in the ocean or these threads in this tapestry of experience um one other way i'll describe that's for some people an even more direct inroad into this realization at least just to start with a little bit of 
conceptual framing is to think about lucid dreaming. So if we imagine right now that we're not awake, that we're actually dreaming, and yet we have somehow achieved lucidity. So we've gone lucid to the dream. And so we're looking around at everything and we're saying, oh, okay, so you know, the pen is a dream or the computer is a dream or the window is a dream. Now, if we were really lucid to that dream, we wouldn't have this mindset or this story go going that, oh, all of these are separate, solid, durable objects. We would know that everything is kind of made of dream stuff, if you will, like this kind of the stuff of consciousness. And we would also know the fact that it's all different manifestations of the same mind, right? And so what we can say, and this is in line with the Tibetan tradition of, of dream yoga and sleep yoga, where they're, they're actually trying to see this continuity of consciousness, is that the experience of waking consciousness is at some level processually like no different than the experience of dreaming consciousness. Of course, it's, it's, you know, we can presume that it's bound by sensory experience. So it's, there's the laws of physics and uh, there's, it's more predictable, the waking experience. We're not suddenly flying through the sky or something like that. But in terms of the actual underlying process, the fact that it is all consciousness. And so that's that to actually experientially directly know that and feel that. So it's not just an idea but it's an actually ongoing, persistent, lived experience to the point where I'm literally looking around and perceiving that, you know, if I'm looking up in the sky, like knowing in my bones, like really feeling that that sky is not up there, a separate thing from me, but it's actually just this appearance, you know, on the kind of screen, visual screen of consciousness. That's actually sort of no distant, no distance from me because there's no center me in here. There is no center to this experience. It's this kind of boundless dreamlike field of flowing consciousness. And that, that's, that's non-duality. And it's, it's, it's mysterious. It's ultimately unknowable. I mean, I don't ultimately know what it is. It would be presumptuous of me to claim some intellectual understanding of it. All these terms, non-duality, the spiritual language, the neuroscientific language, they're just kind of approximations or pointers to something that is, is ineffable but also unmistakably real. I, I mean, when you, you can feel it, you know, and I, I guide people through this process every day of waking up to this experience. Yeah. See, I know like full honesty on my side, I find this stuff so intangible and of course it is extremely complex, but I think there will be some people listening to this who, and I know from some feedback who like love this conceptual stuff and they get it. And it's like, they're so curious about the nature of, the world and what's around us and then others who are like oh it just feels so unreal I, I just zone out I don't know what significance yeah. it has to my life and I don't know what to do with that information so let's really? speak yeah. a little bit to the people who have the latter experience why does this actually matter and how could that help somebody with their own health and well-being absolutely yeah and I'm 100% with you I actually when I work with people I spend so little time on this intellectual stuff. Um, I mean, I literally just give people this this spiel similar to what I gave you right now. And then I just tell them, and now we're, we have no reason to talk about intellectual philosophical stuff whatsoever, because if we do that, it just becomes immediately very dead and very abstract and inaccessible. And like you're saying, it's like, why would I care about this? And so we quickly go into the experiential, which the best way I can answer your question, if we have time to do this, is actually just to guide our listeners on a very brief experiential exercise. And I think that will hit home, my hope, for, for why we do this. Let's do it. Um, yeah, because it's really, it's much more like learning to ride a bike. It's not about like learning to write an essay or something. It's like a, a feeling, almost like a dance. And when you feel that dance, everything starts to change. So so yeah, let's let's just do a very simple exercise. We can do this with our with our eyes just wide open. We don't have to close our eyes and go into some kind of special meditation. But basically our experience usually, and this is my experience for most of my life, is that when we just sit here right now listening, there's some sense of separation of being stuck in our head usually. So there's usually there's a there's quite a voluminous stream of thoughts, right? And those thoughts are telling us stories about ourselves. And those stories can often be very negative and very anxiety producing or shame ridden. And so as we're staying in that territory and the solidity of those thoughts, there's some feeling of being muffled. Like to me, it almost feels as if when I'm there, like someone has put a blanket over my head. And so 
just like in here and, and the rest of the world and its vibrancy and the colors and the sounds of just experience are, are significantly diminished because of all that exercise. And so what we're gonna do in this exercise is to open our mind and our consciousness a bit to really investigating consciousness with this kind of childlike presence, this, this freshness, almost as if we have just arrived in a human body for the first time. And so what we'll do right now is, is do that in the visual field just briefly. And so when we do these kind of exercises, we can do this in any of our senses and all the senses kind of blend into one, but, but with seeing to start with, our habitual way of seeing this dualistic is that we feel like we're seeing stuff. So there's a sense of I'm over here in my head and I'm thinking, 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 and I'm looking around at objects and, you know, even people kind of become objectified in the sense of, oh, like I need to talk to that person or I need to eat this food or, and there's a, some sense of craving and need and incompleteness and managing our world in this instrumental kind of way. So to shift out of that right now, what we have to do is to interrupt the process of seeing stuff and start to see seeing. So there's this kind of folding back that we're actually investigating in this fresh way, the very process of visuality itself to really investigate and, and glimpse it as consciousness and it's kind of dreamlike nature. So to start the actual exercise, we have to notice, and I'll try to describe this for people who aren't watching visually, like see what it's like to notice how your vision in its default way almost has this kind of like tunnel vision-like quality as if you have blinders on. Mm -hmm. So it's like, you're just so narrow focused, most of us on just the focal point of what we're focusing on and see what it's like to start to open your field of vision. And so what this feels like is you're taking the blinders off and you're getting your field of vision wider and wider and wider and wider. And eventually you get it so wide that you're really coming out to this kind of panoramic experience of the this deep peripheral vision. And it, it almost feels as if you're taking in the entire visual field as if it's one seamless kind of fabric. And this is how we also start to see the non-separation of things because it might look, as we look at this visual field, that there's all these separate objects, object, object, object. However, when we look in this big panoramic way, there's a sense you can start to get of almost like looking at a vast mirror or something like that, like at a, at a gym, you know, you see a mirror, you see all the shapes and colors and you know it's also all one image. And so we can start to see the singularity of this field of visuality, that it's all one thing, that everything is part of the same fabric. And something else that's very interesting that you can start to notice is if you really search your peripheral vision, trying to find where it ends, you know, so you can kind of, you know, kind of look up and down and around and try to find where can I see where the, my peripheral vision actually stops. And you'll find that you just can't do that. There's something very curious happening where there's visual information and then suddenly it's just, there's nothing or it just sort of fades out into this feeling of boundlessness or edgelessness. And this is a very interesting experience because this is a fundamental property of consciousness because it turns out that consciousness by definition, it only is conscious of what it's conscious of, and it's not conscious of what it's not conscious of. And so it can't perceive like a hard boundary or wall between those things. And so there's this really interesting fade out effect. And now you still might be wondering, okay, cool, nice parlor trick, but like, why would you want to do this? And so, well, it turns out that our suffering is caused by, in this non-dual frame of, of working, our sense of separation and our sense of attachment to our stories. And we're in our head, constantly judging ourselves and thinking and planning and so forth. There's this feeling that we are disconnected from the flow and vibrancy of life. Now, when you put that down and you come into this moment of just open consciousness, there's also, a, for many people, a very immediate physiological and even emotional feeling to this. And we like open up and we rest and we breathe and we come out to this peripheral field and we take everything into this panoramic way. And I've got to. I've got to say that is. I have just had that experience. I find it so much harder to connect, like intellectually, and how the people are listening, do it, like <laughs> how they're going doing that. But I did. You you mentioned the physiological aspect, and it's true. I did feel more expansive and also grounded, yes. like relaxed somehow. Exactly. That's it. So so now you have that experience. This is mm. this is where the rubber hits the road in terms of what's happening in our vagus nerve and in our our experience of ourselves energetically and physiologically. Is that being in our heads, we're in this kind of 
frightened animal mode where we're in fight or flight, even in some small way, almost all the time, like trying to defend this thing we call need. But when we take a moment just to open into this field of awareness, there's all sorts of neurological things happening that I could talk about. But the, the most important thing is the subjective feeling of relaxation actually that arises. And it feels as if you are at the top of a mountain is how I usually describe it. Or like you've entered some beautiful forest. Like nature kind of does this for us naturally, but we can actually do this at any moment, even just sitting in your office or even just sitting here right now listening. If you take a moment to see seeing, suddenly you're really in the edge of nowness and you feel relaxed and you feel your nervous system kind of settling. And like you said, you feel grounded. And that is deeply transformative because if you can do this and you can do it not just right now, but you can do it 10,000 times a day. And that sounds like, oh my gosh, that's so much effort. But actually it's it's not because every time you do it, you're letting go of the bad dream of separateness and you are awakening and relaxing into this, this beautiful experience of oneness. And then it becomes a more seamless experience. And that is just, and as far as I'm concerned as a therapist, the most healing medicine there is out there in terms of healing from trauma, in terms of healing from depression and shame, of really just coming into the sense of completeness right here, right now, and having that be a, a consistent lived experience. Yeah, beautifully said there. And I think it's an easy one to remember in that sense with the I'm seeing, seeing. I've never heard yeah. that in terms of like removing the blinders and widening your field of vision as such fascinating but yeah I really felt that in my body that was awesome <laughs> that totally surprised me wow that's great let's too, too, yes yeah. do no try so, you know maybe when you're not driving or something I don't know when you can really uh, relax but mm -hmm. let's go to a bit about suffering so you've mentioned this word a few times and yeah. the excessive rumination that so many yeah. of us can be prone to can you speak a little bit to other things in general that kind of cause us unnecessary suffering and where that has come from, even from like an evolutionary perspective, for instance. Yeah. So there's so many different ways to talk about this. And again, it's sort of like non-duality. It's like, in some ways, I could say, I don't know. I mean, everything's sort of a mystery. Like, why do we suffer? Right? There's no sort of ultimate answer to that. But we can, we can slice that question through all these different lenses, looking at, yeah, evolutionary biology or spirituality or neuroscience. And you know, the way I like to describe it, what makes sense to me is that we have ev evolution's main goals were survival and reproduction, right? Um, you know, I'm kind of anthropomorphizing evolution, but if we're going to frame it that way, that it, the certain incentives that underlie its, its process, it's survival and reproduction. So we, what we don't see in there is peace and happiness and equanimity. Those are not really like essential to survival and reproduction. So what that means is that our, our nervous system evolved, optimized for certain kinds of reactive behaviors that would have benefited us very much so in, let's say, you know, ancient environments where there was all kinds of constant threats from saber-toothed tigers and so forth. And so, so most of us have this very keyed up overactive amygdala, let's say, response where we're, we're in this continuous state of anxiety and stress because we're constantly ruminating and anticipating the next threats. And so it's it probably helped our species survive, but it also has made us so incredibly anxious as a species and, and introduced in us this impulse to, to constantly master our environment and control things. And, um, and, you know, and there's obviously a whole cultural piece there in terms of Eurocentric versus indigenous thinking that we could get into as well. But there's, I think there is sort of a baseline element of being human that, that has this sense of anxiety and kind of separation. Um, and, and yeah, and you can, you know, because I'm a social worker, I'd be remiss if I didn't also add in just a note about systems of oppression, too, because that's so real, especially, you know, speaking as somebody with my privileges being white. I mean, you know, the way that yeah, suffering shows up in the moment, in the mind and in the body. And so there's all these different ways, of course, at a social level that that's being conditioned of course. in terms of fresh oppression. Right. Yeah. 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 So rumination, emotional attachment to impermanent things, relationships yeah. you've also mentioned. And we often have a tendency to repeat what is familiar to us, even if it doesn't yes. serve us. Of course, yes, that's another, another running theme. But let's go over into what you do in terms of your professional work and how you assist yeah. people to move through this suffering. Absolutely. Yeah. So, so what I do right now is, is primarily what's called psychedelic integration. So I don't currently 
guide people on psychedelic journeys, although that'll be changing really soon in next year, which I'm really excited about because <laughs> Oregon's laws are shifting. Uh, so integration means that I'm preparing people for their journeys, and then I'm seeing them on the other side to help them integrate that. And basically, the way I summarize my work, and I make it very, very simple, is basically I just teach people just two things. And the first thing, what I like to summarize it as is, I it sounds a little bit strange, but I, I teach people to, to keep their hand on a hot stove, is how I describe it. Um, now, what I mean by that is... That doesn't, that. yeah, because I'm not sure the average therapist is going to say that without some kind of disclaimer. Like, yeah, everyone yeah, go hear for me, hear me out. <laughs> hear me out. It's deeply transformed. So so this gets into evolutionary biology piece. So so when you literally, of course, I'm not speaking, I'm speaking metaphorically, when you literally put your hand on a hot stove, what happens? Well, your, your mind, your nervous system is deeply automatically reflexively encoded to avoid pain and seek pleasure. So immediately you take your hand off, right? And that makes sense from a survival perspective. Unfortunately, our nervous system makes a certain categorical error when it comes to emotional experience because it treats emotional experience in, in the same way as it treats physical pain, right? So when we have emotional pain, the reflexive reaction is, oh, I need to avoid that and I need to get away from it, right? Yeah. And so this is what haunts many of us is that when we're traumatized, when we're children, we learn all these patterns of avoidance and we... we of armor ourselves and yes to a certain extent that can help us survive challenging environments but when we get to be adults and we're carrying around this armor all the time it's actually a huge separation and it's causing us all this suffering so so this is so counterintuitive because when people come into even coming into the therapy environments you know so often people and it's not their fault this is part of our wiring part of our trauma is that people have such a hard time talking about difficult emotional content. And I have to tell so many of my clients to relax the impulse to smile because we have this cultural reflex to just continuously smile, 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 to try to, to put a lid on any little expression of suffering and sort of escape it, even as this very subtle facial kind of way. So we have this, we're constantly removing our hand from the stove, removing hair from the stove with any little emotional stress. And so when I say, keep your hand on the hot stove, I'm very clear with clients how I do this very gently. I tell them like what we're going to do is, and I do this using meditation, specifically kind of what's called like Vipassana meditation, is we're going to do some exposure therapy where we're going to start to talk about difficult experiences. And of course, we're, we contract for that. So it's it's not flooding people, but it's, it's the right level of challenge for them. So let's say I'm just going to make something up like that somebody had a, a difficult traumatic experience where their father yelled at them. Let's say and that memory just still haunts them. And so I have them imaginally can you, you know, just can you speak yeah. to a particular client anonymously but could you use an example yeah mm, let's see yeah so i'm thinking of a, a particular client who had this incident similar to what i was saying actually of, of growing up in this rv park and having this incident where their father dropped a, a glass of water on the floor of the rv and their father just like completely like went ballistic and, you know, yelled at them and sent them out of the RV. And so, so they internalized this sense of, of deep shame and this deep kind of anxiety around making mistakes in social environments and things like that. So, so if I'm taking this, this person, what I'll do is I'll guide them through, okay, let's do this exercise where I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and go back into this memory and related it to me, actually in the present tense, um, this comes from prolonged exposure therapy yeah. approaches, where I'm having you actually invite your, your mind to bring up that experience as if it is happening again right now. And the intention here, it sounds it sounds sadistic, but it's, it's and this is like keeping the hand on the hot stove, but it, this is where the magic happens because we're actually intending to trigger someone. And I say that to this great compassion where it's like, it's, it's the right titration, where it's like, we're not going to flood you, but it's like that right level where we both contract for this, where you know that something's going to come up when you go back into this memory. And the way it comes up is it comes up in the nervous system. And it's usually along this vagus nerve axis. So, so once people are really in this memory and they're relating it to me and they finish the story, then I invite them. I say, now tell me, what are you feeling in your body right now? And this is just revolutionary for most people, because for most folks who have been traumatized, they've spent their entire lives avoiding ever directly feeling the pain of this memory. And they've done that a million different ways. It could be through addictions. It could be through seeking, you know, relationships and through sort of different attachment styles. It could be through 
the most common avoidance mechanism is just thinking itself. You know, we can trick ourselves into thinking that we're emotionally processing a trauma because we're thinking about it. But actually what we're doing is we're in this state of abstraction and we're not directly processing something in the body. And that's where the magic happens. So I invite them to, to go into the body and for the first time in your life, literally feel what this memory feels like. And all of a sudden, people will say things they've never said before in their life. And they'll say, oh, you know, so I'm using this client, you know, this client would say like, you know, they said, I'm feeling my, my heart rate is increasing right now. You know, mm -hmm. and I'm feeling this tightness in my throat. And I'm feeling this, this weird, cold, gripping feeling like a fist clenching in my stomach and my face is, my jaw is feeling tight. And so, and then I, I'm continuing to support them through this and saying, okay, like, tell me more. Let's go deeper. So you're feeling this feeling in your stomach. Like, how, how big is that? You know, is it pulsing? Is it rippling? Is it, is it deep within? Is it on a surface? You know, is there heat? Is there... So, so what we're getting into is these kind of textural details. And this is the essence of Vipassana meditation as you're moving from intellectual abstraction into this very refined, fine-grained presence with the actual sensory experience. And it may sound very technical and almost like cold or something like that, but it's actually incredibly compassionate because what it's doing is it's giving this, ourselves this incredible gift of something that we didn't get when we were children, which is having this compassionate presence with the feeling as it is, not trying to make it go away, not trying to shame it, not trying to shut it down. And most of us when we're children, we receive this messaging of just, you know, turn that frown upside down or just leave me alone or just stop crying or something like that or we get struck or punished. And what we needed was love. We needed someone to just be with us, even just silently, just holding us. But the beauty is that we can do that for ourselves as adults. And this is also, we can call it reparenting, right? When, when the feeling arises, the pain, and when we don't try to escape, we come into it, we notice it, we notice it. We're doing that with this kind of compassionate presence. And then here's where the amazing thing happens. And it's just like, it sends, you know, goosebumps all over my body, just like thinking about it right now, because it's just so incredible to witness this, is that somebody, you know, this client, the ground this like will experience this, this like wave coming through where the nervous system activity is rising. And then they're, they're feeling the crest of that wave and this is like, oh my gosh, can I handle this? And then all of a sudden, as they notice and come into presence, the wave crashes and they're on the other side of it. And all of a sudden the light bulb turns on and they realize, oh my God, I can feel my feelings directly in my body and they are not going to destroy me. This is, this is revolutionary. Yes. And that's where everything starts to change because the cycle of emotional avoidance is broken and they're able to come into compassionate presence with their experience in the moment as it's arising. And so you realize like with physical things, of course, you take your hand off the hot stove. With emotional pain, you leave your hand on the hot stove and you realize that the heat is actually totally harmless because it's actually just energy in the body. And that's the, real, the realization. Beautifully said, Mark, really. So tangible. I'm going to remember the hot stove as well. I've got my seeing, seeing, and I've got the hot stove. <laughs> this is my key takeaway so far. I have two questions, though, yeah. on that note. Some things that came up for me there. One, what is the difference between somebody talking about this, even like talk therapy or mm. kind of even sharing, sharing with a friend or somebody close to them, perhaps even oversharing as such. Yeah. You know, we hear about that as a trauma, yes. trauma based response to just speak, speak, speak. Yeah. Or think, 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 as you said, right. and actually living that in the body. So it's the first thing that come up that I'd like yeah. you to elaborate on. And the second thing is, if somebody doesn't have access to a therapist like you, or they themselves are feeling this, or somebody close to them that they love dearly is having this kind of experience, how can they? hold this space that you're talking mm -hmm. about and be this compassionate person to allow them to feel this emotional pain in order to release it rather than avoid it continuously over a longer period of time. Yeah, absolutely. So the talking piece is really a fine dance. And you're right that, that speaking is very subtle because speaking can be very connected with thinking and it can absolutely be a tool of emotional avoidance. The mind is so sophisticated at finding these little escape hatches that it can use anything to escape feeling, even meditation itself. And this is why I have to really, really get very detailed with people and inquire what they're experiencing moment by moment, because you can absolutely do that same exercise, bring up a feeling. And then instead of focusing on the feeling itself, you can just focus on your breath, let's say, and say, 
okay, just gonna focus on my breath. Just gonna focus on my breath. I'm not gonna not gonna feel that uncomfortable feeling in my heart or this uncomfortable feeling in my chest. And then what are you doing? You're training yourself, yeah, perhaps to increase your level of of baseline just vocal attention, right? But you're you're not really processing the feelings in the body. And I know this because I did that for years, right? So you can do that with meditation. You can certainly do that with talking, where the talking is a kind of avoidance. It's coming out of anxiety. And so I, I don't have a sort of ruler rubric for this. It's more about, it's a very delicate dance. And this is where it does help to work with a professional to do the first part and then I'll get to the second part. Because what I'm doing with people is after sitting with just hundreds of people over the years for just so many hours, I'm really finely attuned. And actually, in some ways, Zoom helps with this because I'm seeing their face like so close and I'm tracking everything and I'm tracking my face and, and seeing our level of attunement. And so I'm looking for all these little subtle cues and micro expressions to see it, when somebody is talking, are they talking while feeling in the body or are they talking while dissociating and going into abstraction? Yeah. And there are all these little tells that I, that I can tell usually, you know, sometimes I make mistakes, but most of the time, you know, I check in with people. And so it's, it's little things like if you perceive incongruent affects is the term where if someone's talking about their pain, but they're smiling or giggling through it. And of course, I have to be so compassionate as I make these observations because I don't, I don't want to make people feel like they're being judged. But I have to point out to them like, hey, like I'm noticing you're telling this just excruciating memory and you're smiling and laughing. I wonder what it might be like to invite your face to show the full expression of what you're feeling. And then that takes people out of the dissociation into a, a deeper connection. Other things are when people are talking and they're looking up words, like a lot of times that's a tell that that. You know, usually when we do that, we're cutting off our visual field. So we're going because we're trying to devote more resources into cognition. And so when I see people looking up a lot, kind of, well, this, you know, I can tell there's something going on. Also, like, at, this might sound very nerdy, but it's true. Etymology. Um, I'm such a huge, like, I took Latin and uh, Russian and college and stuff like that. And I love language and etymology. So when people are speaking Latin without realizing it, I mean, I work in English, but when people are using a lot of Latinate, roots like they're talking about their their cognition or the information or the the situation i mean it's kind of latinate endings like latin is a very abstract kind of language in many ways it's a very conceptual language and so it's but when people are speaking like more like german without realizing it but i mean german roots like in french or these sort of like nordic roots it's like mm, I, you know i'm feeling the, the the grumble in my stomach or the, the kind of these much more short almost like automotive poetic kind of words like there's a there's a rippling in my chest, you know. That, that's when I know. Okay, you're feeling into this. You're not speaking Latin. You're speaking like something that's a little more close to the body. Wow, never heard yeah. that before. Roots of the words. There we go. Etymology. Who knew? Yeah, <laughs> and I'm not like any kind of linguist, but I just it's just something I noticed, you know. But but to speak to your second point, yeah, I mean, of course, accessing a therapist, there's problems there in terms of privilege, right, and accessibility, and so. This is where actually YouTube has been incredible. The internet has been incredible for this proliferation of all these different techniques. And so I would say, you know, if I was to give advice to someone who doesn't have access to a therapist, wants to start this work on their own, the first thing I would just say is it's a really transformative practice to if you can just set a timer for just 10 minutes a day, uh, just, you know, you could do it first thing in the morning and just sit quietly and just notice the feeling in your body. And really look through your body for any kind of emotional feeling. And if you if you want to do this kind of exposure, like I'm talking about, where you're thinking about specific memories and processing them, by all means, do that. If that feels like, okay, this is way too triggering, I need a professional, leave that aside. But just start with, how am I feeling in my body? Get out of the stories and into the actual texture of sensory emotional experience. And then throughout the day, and this is, I tell this to all my clients, it's incredible practice is just anytime you notice yourself feeling stuck, feeling abstracted, feeling lost in rumination and, or dissociated, just simply ask yourself, what's my body doing right now? And what that does is it cuts through all of the rumination, all of the kind of hamster wheeling of shame, going to the past, going to the future, and it comes right into the present moment and the texture and it brings you into, oh, wow, my, my chest is, feels like a rock right now. It's really tight and you know, my stomach is pulsing. And what happens is naturally when you notice that stuff, when you notice it, even if you just take 30 seconds or a minute to notice it, you will feel this, when I talk about this kind of wave-like phenomenon, you'll notice 
um, the arising of the sensation. And then as you stay with it, instead of contracting out of it or trying to escape it, you will notice the activation level will decrease. And then again, that's that little magic moment where you realize, ah, I don't have to escape this. I can survive this. And it's incredibly empowering because you realize you have within you without necessarily needing a therapist, without necessarily needing some kind of advisor or confidant, the ability in the moment to reparent yourself and actually be present compassionately, mindfully for your own experience. Yeah, absolutely. And I can imagine that would cultivate a lot of self-trust and a lot of deep-seated confidence if you can get to that point where you can do something alone. Of course, that's going to be different for different people and where they're at in, in their journeys. But um, yeah, to really be brave enough to cultivate that space, that pause to go within and to get curious. I know one thing I've been doing recently is asking myself what happened immediately before I noticed this because mm -hmm. I realized I got to the point where I was somehow some feeling like you know a tightness in my throat or just uh something in my stomach and I didn't know where that came from and I felt like it yeah. it felt like a dead end honestly it was like but I don't mm. actually know I can't I can't identify what went wrong so to speak and I think even even to that it's such a practice to get to the point yeah. that you notice what your triggers are as such because you know when we often talk about triggers in this space we think of it as being something wildly uncontrollable I find mm -hmm. like you had a, a big emotional outburst or, but that's not necessarily the case, is it? You know, it could come in something really subtle and mild that still disturbs you, puts you off balance, makes you enjoy yourself less, feel less present, but it could be, a, yeah, more inconspicuous. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Well, I feel like I'd be remiss if I didn't, uh, I mentioned there were two things that I teach people, so I don't want to leave our listeners hanging <laughs> before I just mentioned the second one, which is, after you learn to keep your hand on the hot stove and you realize that the heat isn't going to destroy you, that's the first skill I teach. But we're still in duality at that point because everything still feels kind of solid and separate. So that's when I move people into recognizing that the heat, the stove, all of this, it's its kind of like a dream. It's its all arising in consciousness. And in fact, it's not separate from you. So the feeling of the, the metaphorical stove, your emotional experience, or the feelings in your body, or the triggers that actually it's all part of the same seamless experience of consciousness. And so it, all of it has this kind of dreamlike quality to it. And that's the whole non-duality piece. So I start with the Vipassana and then I move into non-duality. And that's in essence what I what I impart and what I guide people to, to really glimpsing in a more, in a deeper way in their psychedelic experiences and integrating. Well, let's speak to psychedelics. So what are they? I hear it's a subclass of hallucinogenic <laughs> drugs and they, well, primary effect, I'm not sure if this depends on whether you're doing it for therapy or somebody's doing something recreationally, but it's kind of to induce this non-ordinary state of consciousness. But in a therapeutic sense, why would why would somebody want to do this? I mean, like like you said, so many people listening would be like, someone's saying I take drugs? What the hell? I've been told my whole right. life that I should never do something like that. And now all of a sudden we have the state of Oregon saying, hey, uh, let's give it a go. Yeah, absolutely. So so psychedelics, and I, I like to kind of start with the term plant medicine, which is used, I find more often within indigenous communities. And it, it speaks to the, the larger, longer history of medicinal usage of plants that goes back thousands of years and it was pioneered by indigenous peoples all around the world. And so, yeah, you look at mushrooms, for example, and this has been used, I hope I'll get these numbers right, but I want to say it's something like at least like 5,000 years, like going back, you know, you have indigenous peoples within Mexico and Central America, and there's different archaeological evidence and, uh, you know, ayahuasca, they're still figuring out exactly how long, but I think at least 500 years we've seen and some, some people say, Say longer within the, the Amazon basin. So, so we have these medicines, plant medicines that have been used for thousands of years, you know, all around the world. And the term psychedelic, you know, I won't go into all the history because I know there are other people who could do this much better than me, like Michael Pollan, you know, read Michael Pollan's book, How to yeah. Change Your Mind. You'll get the whole story there. But there was sort of a, let's say, a, a rediscovery or how can I say it? I'd be sensitive with these terms because there's this whole phenomenon of like Columbus saying, right, of like white people sort of finding these things and thinking like, oh, wow, I discovered psychedelics, but these have been around forever. But but so the term itself, psychedelic, is more of a white Western term from Humphrey Osmond, I believe, that goes back to once like the 
50s. But but yeah, there, there was sort of a more recent 20th century kind of lineage of, of people uh, discovering mushrooms. And this, this they were taught by, you know, Maria Sabina, who was a, a Mazatec um, a healer, medicine woman. And then other kind of white anthropologists like traveling to South and Central America and like encountering ayahuasca and bringing this back. And then, and then, of course, we have the more synthetic medicines like LSD, which start to come on the scene with Albert Hoffman. And then I believe it was in the 50s. And then we start seeing that come on the scene in the 1960s. And then MDMA entering, you know, in like the, the 80s and so forth. So we have, you know, plant medicines that are primarily, I think of as, as salvia divinorum and, and mushrooms and ayahuasca. And then we have these synthetic psychedelics, such as LSD and MDMA. And LSD is derived from a fungus. So it's not like it is synthetic, but it also has natural precursors. And yeah, I mean, what is a psychedelic? What is a plant medicine? I mean, it's something you're taking that's a psychoactive molecule. Most of these work on a certain serotonin system in the brain, or this receptor called the 5-HT2A receptor. And it's really locking into that receptor and really stimulating it. And what's happening is that so many things are happening, but there's a network in the brain called the default mode network, which when we're talking about rumination and mind chatter and shame, yeah, a lot of that stuff is happening in this particular network. Most of us stay in that network most of the time. That's why it's called the default mode network. And right. when you take psychedelics, that network decreases significantly in activity. And so this is why people experience a sense of selflessness or ego dissolution, or some people would say you have death at higher doses. But not only that, when the default mode network is decreasing, there's all this crosstalk and all these different parts of the brain that aren't usually talking to each other. And so there's just this incredible capacity for what's called neuroplasticity for the brain to rewire itself and to have this really expansive mystical perhaps experience of feeling one with everything of feeling this connectedness with nature, with perhaps some greater sense of cosmic energy or something like that. And so in terms of the, you know, why should people be interested? What's what's the payoff here? I'm not like to use our payoff because it sounds so capitalist, but what's the what's the benefit? What's the healing here? Well, you know, as I said before, I would say that most of us are trapped in our own minds and our own thinking, this kind of rigidified like canalization where we're just trapped in these canals, these trenches in, in our minds. And the metaphor that's often given is imagine like a ski slope where the the slopes have been so uh, ski like over and over again that, that you're just going down the same channels. Right. Essentially. There's not room for growth. And so a psychedelic coming into the, the brain, it's sort of like a fresh snow. So there's the catalyst to inspire really rapid growth and really rapid healing. And there's a lot of emotional processing that's happening in the body. And the research is just really exciting. I mean, it's coming out, it feels like every month there's a new paper or two. I mean, we're looking at you know, PTSD, uh, healing and, and you know, smoking cessation and, you know, all sorts of addiction treatments, treatment resistant depression. Uh, this is the medicine that our, our era needs. You know, psychopharmaceuticals, for the most part, have failed us, I would say, um, because psychopharmaceuticals, like for the most part, I don't want to say. And what is that? But what they is keep... that? What oh, is sorry. That these are like, these are, you know, things like Prozac, right? Like SSRIs pharmaceutical medications that are that are trying to address depression what happens often is they're they're actually they're actually kind of numbing people out so they, they work on a different serotonin receptor site the 5-ht1a and it, it kind of helps people be more resilient so if you're really depressed yeah you can take an ssri and you can kind of white knuckle it through your life you know a little better you know you're, you're more functional and you can you know, get perhaps a little more energy, do what needs to be done. But but when I talk to most of my clients who've been in SSRIs, there's often a sense of numbness or a sense of feeling disconnected. And this also has, you know, sexual side effects. And people just feel like they're disconnected from the vibrancy of life. And mm. taking mushrooms is the complete opposite. It just like completely is like fireworks through your mind and body. And you feel just so plugged into the vibrancy of your experience and you're able to really feel your feelings and it's uncomfortable. It can feel like you're dying. It can feel like you're about to explode. But when you really go through that experience and you process all that, you come out the other side feeling so much more peace, so much less fear of death and so much more just surrender to the flow of life. And the results are speaking for themselves. So it's, it's really incredible. I mean, for me, it's nothing short of miraculous. I can say that I have seen such incredible 
gains from from these medicines. Yeah. Yeah. And speak a little to the legislation changes in your area, because I think a lot of people listening would be like, as I said before, drugs equal bad, typically, you know, the kind of, oh, it's a recreational thing that people use as a form of escapism. And now you're telling me it's Mm. a form for healing and it's actually producing effects that suggest that's actually positive overall. Like, Mm. you know, even another question that comes to mind is, but is it addictive? Am I going to get hooked Mm. on this stuff and then have some kind of dependence problem? Right. Yeah. So it's definitely not addictive. The research is in on that at this point. Mushrooms, I mean, I'm going to focus on mushrooms because that's where the legislation is here. They're simply not addictive. They just don't work like other drugs like opiates or like methamphetamines because first of all, you can't just take, you know, a huge dose of mushrooms and take another dose the next day. It doesn't, you're, your serotonin system needs time to kind of balance and reprocess. So it just, it doesn't, you can't just keep taking it. But even if, you know, people feel moved to try to, or to take mushrooms, it's like, it's, it, there's such, there's so much that comes up and so much to process that, you know, you, you just naturally, I don't know how to say it. It's like, there's, there's not this craving that comes back to return to that space because it gives you homework. It gives you healing to process and integrate. And so if you have a really large journey, most people aren't going to want to return to that for at least a month, you know, because it just, there's so much that you're, that you're so many gifts from the journey that you're unpacking and integrating into your daily life. Is it possible to use mushrooms as a tool of emotional avoidance? I think it's possible. You know, I think people are, are using it in a recreational context. Not that there's anything inherently wrong with that, but it certainly could be because of the set and setting of when you take it influences the journey. It could be a way that people are disconnecting. So that's possible. Um, but when people are coming to it with this this context of healing and insight, the avoidance cycle is broken and there's just no possibility of addiction. In fact, it's curing people of addictions. Yeah. Really? Wow. Oh yeah. That's a huge part of the research. Yeah. For our listeners, if you just, you know, get on Google Scholar or something and just look for, you know, psilocybin and addictions, I mean, it's just, it's just blowing out of the water previous kind of best practices or treatment as usual for for so many different different uh, addictions. I just attended a lecture on this recently. And part of that is because, you know, one of the theory of addictions is that there's a saying that in this field that the opposite of, I think this comes from Johan Hari, that the opposite of addiction is not sobriety, it's actually connection. Connection, yes. And so when people, yeah, when people are addicted, they're feeling disconnected and traumatized and isolated. And so they're looking for the substance to Feel that connection, but of course it, it doesn't. Or maybe there's a, a very temporary feeling, but it's they're you know chasing that. But with psilocybin, you feel like actual connection. You feel actual connection to your your emotions. You feel actual connection to your environment and to consciousness. And it inspires people to. I've seen this so many times to go forth then and seek out connection in their life with you know with with loved ones, reconnecting with people they've been estranged from. You know, wanting to make more friends, wanting to even like quit their jobs if it was really just not serving them in a spiritual sense and finding more meaningful employment where there's more community and connection. And so mushrooms are, they're catalysts for connection. Yeah. Yeah. Right. And so what you've just illustrated there as an example, that's a key part of the integration process that you're talking about. Is yeah. it, so people taking the insights from an experience that they have and then working on making adjustments and changes in their lives. Mm-hmm. So in terms of what you're going to be starting or even what's happening with all of these retreats, I'm going to Costa Rica and, <laughs> you know, I suddenly awesome. realized like, wow, all of this uh, ayahuasca retreat centers mm-hmm. and so like it's all just massively exploding. Like yes. there's clearly a market for that. Side note on that front, I think it could be hard for people who, myself included, who maybe are like curious about this, but don't know where to start. And they feel like there's so many sharks and people to be yeah. aware of and you know, actually how to, how to do that in a way that you feel safe and Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. not ripped off or not taken on a potentially scary ride. Or can you speak a little bit to that in terms of people taking first steps? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's a complicated time because of course we are still living in the age of prohibition, you know, at least here in the United States for the most part. And you do have to be careful and it's, it's sort of a best of times, worst of times with with psychedelics because yes they are kind of coming out from the underground and and receiving this scientific legitimacy and so there's so much excitement and there's so much hype 
And like you're saying, there's also a shadow side to that. There are people out there who are taking advantage. There has been real harm done. And, and it's important to note that, that there, there has been a history here in the United States in particular that I'm aware of, of guides participating in, in systematic abuse of clients, you know, sexually and in other ways, psychologically. And um, for, for listeners who are interested in that, there's a, there's a podcast that is, it's the New York Magazine cover story, and it's called Power Trip. It's very, you know, trigger warning. It's it's very intense. It's very hard hitting. And so it's not going to be for everybody, especially if you've had a trauma history. Just make sure to take care of yourself. But it really goes into detail of, of the, the level of abuse that's happened. So, so just stay in the reality of that. And again, I come from a social work background. So there's so much concern here about, about clients' health and, and safety and, and self-determinacy and... Um, and justice, right? So, so we do have to be very careful in this landscape of selecting guides and, and retreat centers. So for people who are trying to get started, it's like, it's really hard because if you're in the United States, I would say probably your best bet is to, I hate to say this, but like wait a bit, you know, if, if you're trying to do something domestically, like until Oregon has really completely set up its system and then you can, you can really get connected with a licensed facilitator, a licensed service center, and so you know you're in a safe environment. And of course, we also see that other states are starting to go the same way. So Colorado just passed this Proposition 122. So there is going to be this movement towards it, but we have to be a bit patient. Um, if people are elsewhere, have the resources to travel, there are a number of retreat centers that are quite reputable. And I've worked with a lot of clients who have gone there and had really good experiences. So there's, there's Synthesis. Um, in the Netherlands has a really excellent reputation. In Jamaica, we have Myco Meditations for psilocybin. Since this is also psilocybin, and you know, Costa Rica, there's Saltara is a retreat center that a lot of my clients have gone to that have had great experiences. Mm -hmm. uh, Rhythmia is another one that I've heard great things about from clients. And um, also, there's uh, Lotus Vine Journeys. This is very interesting experience. It's particularly near and dear to my heart because Spring Washam, who is the creator and the facilitator of that, she's doing this really fascinating work where she's weaving together Buddhist wisdom, which of course I'm so uh, enamored of, with, uh, with ayahuasca to create this kind of novel synthesis. And I think she's just doing really amazing transformative work there. So that's a, a really powerful place too. So so those Thanks are kind of the, the above recommendations. I'll options. put them in. I'll put them yeah. in the in the show notes for anyone who's curious and wants to take a, a little further look for themselves. I'm going to move into final fast few questions yes. now, Mark. And the first thing I want to ask you is: Is there something that you used to believe that you no longer believe? Yeah, I think the first thing that just sprang up is the belief that I'm separate, and that's the fundamental thing. And it's really more of an implicit than an explicit belief. It's not as if I was going around in my mind telling myself, oh, I'm separate. But implicitly, and this is the the sort of the bad dream of duality, right? Is there's this felt sense of I am a solid object thing called Mark that is durable in existence. And I'm particularly centered in my head, particularly centered behind the eyes. There's this feeling of I'm separate. And that's the belief, this implicit belief that I have held. And yeah, through this combination of, of meditation of psychedelics, like that implicit belief has dissolved. And so there is now just this more or less persistent experience of a kind of openness, you know, where there used to be like a center of consciousness that has opened up into this kind of wide expansive meadow of just this field of being that is just sensations are doing their dance moment by moment. And it's really hard to find in that some separate Thing, who's this kind of controller character in there who somehow is the puppet master who's making things happen. I just I can't find that person anymore. Um, it just feels like, you know, there's a bird chirping and then there's, you know, a feeling in my, my chest or my heart beating and that, it's just all happening on its own spontaneously. It's a beautiful relief, actually. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> beautiful. This may link a lot, but second, what does spiritual awakening mean to you? Spiritual awakening. But I would say to continue from the belief, it's it's the the experiential dissolution of that belief. Right. So it is it's 
it's something that is a felt sense that the the veil between self and other self in the world is a construction and it's an illusion and mm -hmm. falling away and experiencing the sense of oneness and spirituality is a tricky word because it there's so many things that our mind codes as like spiritual or not spiritual right so like maybe like chanting or or meditating that's like spiritual but you know cleaning my cat's litter box well, that's not spiritual but the beautiful thing about this kind of awakening is that everything is like everything is sacred because everything is consciousness and so when I'm cleaning my pet's litter box, like, you know, it's like, who's doing that? It's the, the sensations of litter boxing are happening on their own and the, the sounds and the smells and it's like the textures and it's all part of this living dance of experience and it's all really beautiful and vibrant and that feels deeply spiritual. So in a sense, spirituality kind of collapses into just the feeling of being moment by moment. What is one quote or affirmation that resonates with you that you'd like to share? Well, building on that theme, there's the poet Hafiz, I may be mispronouncing that a little bit, but to the best of my knowledge, he's a, a, a mystic poet. Uh, there's a quote, now is the time to know that all you do do is sacred. I love that quote because it encapsulates that, that collapse between the sacred and the non-sacred, that everything that is happening in this moment is, is, is sacred. And even moving beyond that, that word that thought it just it everything feels holy actually i mean it's it may sound hyperbolic but it's it's true that when you know through psychedelics and meditation when you really feel the pulse of the vibrancy of consciousness like everything you look at i mean i can just look at i don't know my bone this very ordinary mundane object and it's like it's a it's an appearance of light that is so beautiful it's like shining with its own light of consciousness and that's you know it's everything sacred <laughs> so, yeah right. and lastly what is one final message that you will give our listeners who are on or want to embark on this journey to connect with their inner selves and do this consciousness work? Hmm. I would say start with feeling your body. That's the most important thing to begin because most of us are in the story of our, our mind and we're without meaning to muffling yeah. ourselves from the direct experience of of nowness and the easiest way to access that is just to start to notice especially the feelings of emotions in your body you start there once you get grounded in that that just changes everything because you no longer have to be running away from your feelings you can actually feel your feelings and in some ways that's even more transformative than than the spiritual awakening part because some people can have a spiritual awakening but there's still a lot of bypassing or still a lot of emotional avoidance happening you know so there's a lot of pieces of integration so the emotional pieces is so transformative and then if you know if you feel inspired yeah try to seek out a, a plant medicine or psychedelic experience in a way that's safe and legal take up a meditation practice um, there's so many resources i mean we're living in a very challenging time right now but also it's an amazing time because we have so many resources and tools and teachers out there that i'm so grateful for to help me and and yeah go go looking there's an abundant field of things out there <laughs> so true yeah so true and you'll always find somebody that resonates with you and that's part of it yeah. too finding what works mark it has been a pleasure thank you so much for sharing your story your knowledge your wisdom it's much appreciated yeah, yeah well thank you Jen. and I, I just i love this podcast it's it's so <laughs> click to the um it's been a, a gift to to find out about it because yeah starting over i've done that so many times so i, I love I've never had a chance to actually tell my story in this way. So it's a, it's a great gift. I thank you for that. Oh, beautiful. Thank you so much.